Hallelujah. If you have your Bible with you, turn to Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4. Mentioned a time or two, kind of helpful to remind us, I think, of where our roots are. This was one of the large churches in the early church. When I say church, I'm talking about the whole city. In that one city of Ephesus, we don't know how many different congregations there were, how many different uh, particular elders in each church, and then who knows how many deacons. Timothy served there. I think uh, I have heard that John the Beloved served in Ephesus. Quite a powerful church, gospel-preaching, Bible-believing church. We're looking at chapter 4, verses 11 through 15, to, I'm sorry, through 13 tonight, 11 through 13. And I'm just kind of asking the question, who's who? Speaking of members of the body of Christ, who's who? Hopefully we can find out. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. One of the things I like about a message like this, it's the kind of teaching, the kind of message, the kind of truth a believer can take with them anywhere, regardless of what other number of different congregations they may visit or be members of before Jesus comes, they can take something like this with them and that will help them suss out a particular church or, or, or congregation they're thinking about fellowshipping with or, or ministering through. I want to look with you at, uh, who, at God's gifts, first of all. It's a beautiful picture. And then who's who, how these gifts work. And again, read yourself in here. Uh, this is for both ministers, full-time ministers, as well as what we would call uh, spirit-filled lay people. Something for everyone. That's what we want to look at tonight. I want to say right off the bat that, as I've mentioned a time or two, we believe in the verbal inspiration of the Scripture, meaning the very words the writers used were inspired of the Holy Spirit. Not only that, but sometimes, even in our English versions, sometimes even um, a comma, a period, a semicolon, a colon can make a difference in how you read something. And we'll see that tonight. In tonight's text, it's actually a, a comma that some Bible scholars, uh, a few translations, remove. And it changes the meaning of, meaning of everything. And we want to look at that tonight. Anybody dinosaur here, you were saved in the 70s? Thereabouts. Praise God. I got a couple. Yeah, there was a real Jesus movement at that point. A lot of people got saved a lot of believers received the Holy Spirit. There was a move of God uh, in the Spirit uh, among the traditional denominations that weren't normally open to that. Great time to be alive and to, to know the Lord. But I think what we're going to look at tonight, the so-called downside of it, started in that Jesus movement in the 70s. Some people have still not let go of it because some people are still teaching it. What on earth are you on about, preacher? Well, let's dive in and find out. Amen? Amen. We begin with God's gifts. Listen to Paul, Ephesians 4, verse 11 and following. And he, and this is interesting and important, he adds another, he, didn't have to, because it was already in the verb, he, he, aftos, for, for emphasis, and he, he, speaking of Christ, after he ascended, gave some, the apostles, and the prophets, and the evangelists, and the shepherds and teachers. So this is Paul speaking of Christ after his ascension to the throne of God. And as I say, he, he emphasizes that it was the Lord that gave these gifts. Uh, he didn't just say he gave. He says he, he gave. Uh, the idea is these do not originate with you. They don't originate with me. They don't originate on the manward side. These gifts are not something you and I look over in the scripture like a catalog and then say, well, I like this. I think I'll be that. I'd like to become one of those. Doesn't work that way. They're gifts that came from God. Now, the ones I've just mentioned are people. How many can see that? Apostles, that's a person, a prophet, an evangelist, uh, a, a shepherd or pastor, a teacher. Those are people. So these are gifts that... Strictly speaking, the person doesn't have, it's what he or she is. You read, for example, in the Old Covenant, uh, Yahweh told Jeremiah he had called him to be a prophet from where? Yeah, from his mother's womb. That's Old Testament. Yeah, it's also New Testament. Galatians chapter 1, Paul says that the Lord separated him for apostolic ministry from his mother's womb. So when he came out of the womb, he wasn't just a little baby boy. He was a little baby boy apostle. This was something he had from the womb. 
So these are people. Now, there's another class of gifts. There's several listings of them. One real well-known one is 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 11. There you don't have people or ministers. You have manifestations or gifts. Now, the minister is what the person is, like Jeremiah, like Paul. The manifestation is a shining forth of the Spirit of the Lord inside any believer. 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 11. And these are not permanent possessions. These are on again, off again experiences. You may have heard Bill uh, sitting in the congregation. I mention that because that's the way it ought to work. It shouldn't be just from the platform. You may hear Bill give an exhortation or a prophecy from the congregation. You may hear Missy speaking in a tongue and then interpreting it from the congregation. Now, does that mean they can do that anytime they want to? No, can pray in tongues anytime, but the gift of diverse kinds of tongues for the church, that operates not as we will, as God wills, right? So it's on again, off again, like a flashing bulb, but the minister is that. And uh, as I say, it, it's Jesus that does the choosing. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, it's God who sets the members in the church as it pleased him. So if, if it pleased God to make Pavlos an apostle, that's exactly what happened. If it pleased Yahweh to make Jeremiah a prophet, that's what happened. It didn't matter what anybody else said about it or whether man agreed. Well, where, where does, where does the, the man come in? Where does the believer come in? How does, how does this work? Well, ask Char, ask Missy, ask uh, Bill, ask anybody that operates in the manifestations and they'll tell you, well, I just ask the Lord, use me, use me, you know, to edify somebody else, to build somebody else up. I seek these gifts, as Paul said we should. We can't make them happen, but we seek them. Yes? What about the ministry gifts? What about the person, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher? What, what, what's the manward side of that? Let me give you two, uh, one scripture that really helps. First Timothy 3.1. Let me just make a note of that. 1 Timothy 3, 1. Paul says there to his young protege, if anyone earnestly desires the office of bishop, he desires a good thing. Isn't that helpful? That lets the person that Christ has gifted know that he's been gifted. He will find, she will find a desire that doesn't come and go, but comes and stays to preach, to teach, to evangelize. They may have visions and dreams that they feel compelled of God to share. And it doesn't happen just once in a while. It's a regular thing. I was talking to somebody the other day about how do you know when you're called or how does the ministry call work or what's it mean to be ordained, et cetera, et cetera. And I mentioned in my own case, we see this happening. I was studying uh, journalism and communications. I was going to work in radio or television and so on. Oh, but when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit and consecrated my Christian life, to the Lord's service. I'd been saved about two years, but when I made a consecration of my Christian life, not my unsaved life to the Lord and received the Holy Spirit, I'd say within a week to 10 days, I lost all interest in radio and television. And I found myself wanting to read about preachers. It got to the place where I'd be driving along. I thought mine my own business and I'd start preaching in the car. I could, yeah, I didn't know who I was preaching to, but I didn't even have a cat or a dog in there, captive audience. There was no one. I'd just be tooling down the highway and preach up a storm, give an altar call, you know. And I'd get where I was going. I thought, what in the world are you doing? What has this got to do with top 40 radio, you know, or, or local television? Nothing. I found out I had a desire to preach and teach. I didn't, didn't necessarily want it. It was just there, and it didn't go away. <laughs> Doggone it. So I was what they call on the hook. And so uh, although this happens by God's calling, he chooses the way we know whether we have a calling to a ministry or whether God wants to use us in a manifestation is still uh, involving our own will, right? So Paul talks about earnestly desire those manifestations to prophesy, to speak with tongues and interpret, etc., um, but even with those manifestations, 1 Corinthians 12, 11, all these manifestations, the Spirit works according as 
He wills. Has your heart ever gone out to someone that was maybe close to death for the gift of healing or the gift of faith? And you went to pray for them and it was like laying empty hands on an empty head. You can't make that happen. All we can do is desire it. But we can't make these manifestations happen. We can't call ourselves into the ministry, although some uh, many, too many, uh, are trying to do that even today. So, again, the gifts are people, they're permanent, and may I say this, by the way, a person in the ministry, any of the fivefold can stand in more than one office. You know, I know some pastors that are also uh, evangelists. I know uh, teachers that also have a prophetic gift. Uh, you can have one, two, three, you can stand in all five offices. I've mentioned this before, it's in my, one of my courses, but I think it might be helpful to you as you look at the body of Christ, or maybe watch a particular media minister or listen to somebody on the radio. Um, Dr. Summerall, who uh, was a mighty man of God, full gospel minister, went to heaven in his late 80s. He observed from the scripture that one sign of an apostle is that person, that man or woman can stand in all five of the offices. That's one way to tell someone has an apostolic gifting. They have a gift of ruling, which is the sim similar to the gift of administration that a pastor would have, so they can lead a, a lot of churches or a lot of a group of people in a congregation. Um, and then they, they can also uh, have prophecy and prophetic dreams and visions. How many of you know Paul stood in all those offices? John, you watch them in the book of Acts, you read their epistles. And you see, basically, those who are called apostles uh, basically could stand in, in all five positions. I, I liken the apostolic ministry to a standard shift car, a five-speed, like my Miata, that I sewed into someone else's life. Got tired of shifting. That shift got, got more and more difficult. It wasn't my age. Don't say that. But I think of the apostolic office like that. So at one point, Paul's a prophet and a teacher early in the book of Acts. Then he becomes an apostle and goes out to particular people groups. Then once he gets there, like in Ephesus for three years, he, he not only itinerates and visits the various different congregations as an apostle, but no doubt he had his own home congregation also. We see that in Acts 28. He finished up his career in a house church, didn't he? Do you mind if I say that again? I got to tell you, I still don't get that. How could someone like Paul have a local church in his house for two years without outgrowing it? Don't you just imagine people would be coming hither, thither, and yon to listen, just to listen to Paul cough, you know, or just breathe on me, breathe this way, cough this way. Paul, you going to sneeze right here. Wouldn't you imagine it really? And yet after two years, he had not outgrown that house church. Just, I'm just throwing it out there. I just, I still can't figure it out. Not a trick question. Don't understand it. Anyway, that's how he finished up as a pastor of really a house church. Uh, what about the other gifts? What about the other gifts? How do they operate within the church? You can write this one down too if you want. Philippians 1.1. You ever wonder about archbishop so-and-so, bishop so-and-so? What about you? Oh, you're just a pastor. You know, what, I'm just an evangelist. I'm not an archbishop or a bishop. You ever wonder, what, what, what is all that about? Well, uh, <clears throat> I hope you wonder. If not, you're, you're getting the answer anyway. Philippians 1.1 really helps along this line. Paul greets a group of people in the city of Philippi. He says, greeting to you saints in the city. That's a city, not a church in the city of Philippi, with the bishops, plural, and deacons. Now, that's the, that's the setup of a local church, not the American church. In America, deacons are laymen that are on a board and tell the pastor what to do. Biblically, deacons are assistant pastors. They're ministers of the word. They assist the pastor, bishop, elder, three words for the same office. It's very interesting, beloved, if you read what are known as the church fathers, early ministers of the gospel, succeeding the apostles, people that wrote in the second century, maybe people that sat under the ministry of Peter or John. They wrote letters. They're not inspired, but they wrote letters. Interesting. You don't find the concept of a bishop separate from a pastor or elder until the second century. 
And if you read those letters carefully, you come to the conclusion that what became the office of bishop in the minds of the church fathers was really what you and I know and what the Bible describes as an apostle. Some of the church fathers talk about people by name, bishop so-and-so and the pastors under him, like our beloved Paul, like our beloved John or James. How many are tracking with me? They use the word bishop, but what they're actually describing is what used to be called an apostle. Sadly, as early as the second century, those bishops, apostles, had the name and the title, but they didn't have the power. They did not have the signs following. They did not have the kind of authority that Peter and John and James and Paul and Silas and Barnabas had. It became just a title. So you leave this church, you move, whatever, you're looking for a church. Let me just encourage you. Biblically speaking, every local church has one pastor, elder, bishop, three words, same office, and one or more deacons, depending on how many people or how much help that man or woman needs. Tracking with me? Isn't that simple? And now we've made it all confusing, haven't we? We've got vestments and different kind of titles and turned around collars and this and that. You're only a pre Who are you? I'm a priest. Well, I'm a pastor. Oh, I'm a bishop. You know, it gets so confusing and it's actually so simple. So sad that, as usual, anything man gets his hand in uh, gets messed up. Now, what about Okay, you've got one pastor, bishop, elder, and one or more deacons. What happened to the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the teacher? Really good question. Because there are some in America and other countries that say, hey, you know what? No church, no local church is complete unless all five ministries are there, and all five ministries are making decisions on where that church should go, what it should be, do, and have. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible does not teach that. The pastor has the gift of administrations. That's why he's pastor, bishop, elder, because it's a gift to oversee things. A prophet won't have that unless he's got another gift. Evangelists won't have that. You ever been to a church pastored by an evangelist? You hear three points in a poem and an altar call every service. Every sermon is about getting saved. Why? That's, that's the gifting the man has. If he's not standing in another office like, like pastor or apostle, it's not going to work. How many track with me? God forbid you ever go, go to a church pastored by a prophet who has only the prophet office. A prophet is a wonderful gift, a wonderful ministry, wonderful person, but they're not gifted with ruling or administration like an apostle or a pastor. That's why usually local churches pastored by prophets who stand just in that office blow up eventually because that, that there's no supernatural ability to lead. Are you tracking with me? It's so simple. Well, then how do they fit in? They minister in the church under the, you would say, the, the oversight of the pastor, and they minister out from it. Teachers minister in their local church, maybe travel out from that to other churches and teach. Apostles, same thing. How many remember the book of Acts? Who was pastor in Jerusalem? Anybody remember? James, right. Well, wasn't Peter also an apostle? But we don't find Peter telling James what to do about the Jerusalem church. Even though he was an apostle in his own right, when he was in his home church, he was under the oversight of James. When I was out on the field, particularly as a missionary, any, to, any place I went to, I, I put myself under the oversight of that local pastor that I was preaching for. I didn't tell him how to run his church or take the big head. Hey, I have an apostolic ministry. You don't. You know, let me, let me tell you how to suss this church out. Never. I just, whatever he said, obviously if it didn't cross the word, whatever he said I would do. Usually whenever I went to a church as a visiting minister, um, I would talk to the pastor before the service. Is there anything I should know? Things that you do or don't do, I don't want to upset the way you do things. You know, I'll just flow in with whatever you do. That's, so that's the way those things work. And uh, how about Philip? He was a, an evangelist, started out as a deacon, got a promotion, became an evangelist. He went out from the Jerusalem church and he wound up down in Caesarea. Isn't that beautiful? It, it, the, the, the church, when it's set up like the Bible wants, it's so simple, but we mess it up. Okay, let's move on from these gifts to who's who. Now remember, it's Paul speaking here. And who is he speaking about? Gifts Jesus gave to men. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. 
Now, it's important we remember this and look at this carefully, or else a believer, what you and I would call commonly a lay person, someone not called to the full time ministry, the fivefold ministry, if we don't get this right, some are still teaching today that every believer is supposed to be constantly out there working signs, wonders, and miracles and getting sinners saved, evangelizing, you know, bringing them up in the faith, discipling them, etc., etc., etc. And God has never asked us to do that as lay people. That is not what lay people are to, are to do. I can't tell you how many Christians walk under this heavy burden that they're not real New Testament believers because they're not doing what the people on TV said they should be doing. And, and here's why. It's this teaching that, that hinges on a little comma that some people want to take out and it changes the meetings, the meanings. Watch this. Look at it with me. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. The ministers, ministers and the ministries in the body are given by Christ with a view to what? Why are the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher in the body? To build up the saints. To build up the saints. The evangelist will get people saved, as can the other offices, but primarily the evangelist. But the, the other ministry gifts are to build up the saints, build up the body of Christ. Now, look, look at what it says here. He gave gifts unto men. He names them in verse uh, 11. And then verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. Do you see a comma there? If you take that out, it reads, the ministry gifts are here to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Do you see that? That makes the preacher's job get his people fixed up in such a way that they can minister. That's where this idea was birthed, that every lay person is supposed to go out and change the world and upset people, and go to the mall, and stand on the street corner, and tell people that are strangers they're going to split hell wide open, and this and that. It's because they took this, this comma out. But that's not what, the, what this verse is about. Watch it with me. Unto the equipping of the saints. Do you know what this word means? It's a very interesting word. It appears only here. Katartismon. Only here. It was used in a medical sense of getting someone unwell healed. It was used of someone furnishing a home. This is not telling a, a, a lay person how to win the world for Christ. It's healing a lay person in the body of Christ. It's mending that person. Think about this. A related word, katartesis, appears once in 2 Corinthians 13, 11. There Paul says... Be perfect. Read it sometime. King James says, be perfect. Live at peace with one another. The word perfect is, is a form of this word. I've got a translation in my office that reads, restore yourselves. Does that sound like teaching someone how to get someone saved so that the pastor doesn't have to do it? Does that sound like teaching someone how to lead a Bible study so the pastor can watch the Super Bowl while his people do his work? No, that's not what's supposed to be happening here. It's related to the word, to the verb katartizo. That's used in Matthew 4.21 of James and John mending their nets. I can't tell you how many people have come through the doors of this church in the three different buildings we've been in over 31, almost 32 years, who have come in messed up and left, if they left, with their head on straight spiritually. They have testified, man, I was, a taken, I was taken advantage of, I was abused, I was confused, um, I, I was sent on, on down rabbit paths, I didn't know which end was up or down, I had a load of condemnation on my neck till I, thank God I found this place, and when Barb and I founded this fellowship, the Lord told us it was to be an oasis. An oasis is a place for a person to get refreshed. 
That's exactly what the ministry gifts, apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, are supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be mending God's people. It's used in Galatians 6.1, the same word of restoring a sinning brother. Someone that you and I would say had a, um, uh, what would you call it? A lifestyle problem like a a dope addict or an alcoholic or sexaholic or shopaholic, someone who doesn't just do the occasional wrong deed, but who's in the grip of something. That word is used of believers putting that person back together. Isn't that a beautiful picture? That's what the ministry is supposed to do. The ministry is, is, is here for the mending, healing, restoring, putting back together uh, the members of the body of Christ. Number two, for the work of service. Again, you take the comma out and it looks like the ministers are supposed to mend, heal, restore the saints for the work of service. But we have to keep reading, don't we? What did that pastor of White Oak Chapel say one time? He used three letters, C-I-E. Context is everything. Keep reading and see where we wind up. It absolutely proves what God is saying here. He's not talking about the pastor getting his lay people charged up so that they can do his job for him and he can go out and play golf, although a lot are doing that. Oh, yeah. I know churches where you better, if you hold your breath till the pastor prays for you, they'll be looking for old blue. You know, three points in a poem, a couple of video clips, and he goes out the back door into his limo if the driver's, you know, ready, and who knows where he goes. And then the elders, you know, lay empty hands on empty heads. They do his work for him. They pray for the sick. They anoint with oil. He's busy, whatever, you know, watching television, um, trying on a new $1,000 suit or whatever. This is not the way it's supposed to be, folks. It should not end there. This is just another description of what the ministry gifts are, are for, for the work of service. What kind of service if it isn't getting the church ready to do his work? Acts 6.4 explains that exactly. Early church, so many people needing help. The apostles were getting sidetracked into this very necessary ministry of seeing that the widows were taken care of, but it wasn't their job. And what did they do? They chose out seven deacons, assistants, to do that work. And they said, but we... We will continually give ourselves to the prayer and the ministry, same word, service of the word. These ministry gifts should be restoring, mending, healing, putting back together broken believers. They should also be serving them the word. I think I've told you two million times. One lady came here and said, should a pastor be able to teach and preach? I thought she was kidding. I thought she was going to get me told because you sure can't, you know, she, she asked me, that, she asked me that question. She said, and she was serious as a heart attack. I said, excuse me. She said, is a pastor supposed to be able to preach or teach? I said, well, of course, one of the characteristics is apt to teach, able to teach. Why? Oh, our preacher said that we should be teaching each other. He shouldn't have to teach us anymore. Just saying. So this is very important, isn't it? Here's a, here's a third thing they do. For the building up of the body of the Christ. Paul says the same thing of the manifestations in 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Just like an apostle, post, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher is there to build up the body of Christ. So the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, discerning of spirits. Paul said, let all those things be done unto building up. So whether it's a manifestation or a minister, the goal should be the same to build up what? The body. Do you see this? This says nothing about Christians doing something for the world. This is all the church. Do you see how clear this is? It's not even mentioning the unsaved world. It's talking about something that takes place within the church. Jesus gave these gifts to the church to heal, to mend, to put back together broken people who are now in his body, to do the work of the service of God's word on their behalf, to feed them and lead them and to build them up. What's the ultimate goal? Until, until the lay people save the world. 
Do you see this? It's not talking about outreach. And I'm so glad these things are recorded and filmed or whatever. Outreach is very important, but that's not what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about the body and the ministry feeding the church and the church ministering to itself through the manifestations. Until, not so we can, the church members can save the world. The point is until we may all arrive at the unity of the faith and of the full knowledge of the Son of God. Isn't that something? Full knowledge. How many have the knowledge of God? I sure hope we do. But this is epi, not just gnosis, epignosis, full knowledge. I don't know about you, but there are some things about Jesus I don't know yet. There are some things about God's plan for man I don't have sussed out yet. How about you? There are some things about healing and the second coming of the Lord and the judgment of unsaved people and what God's going to do with unreached people groups, etc. There are some things that I don't have all the answers to yet. I'm working on it. How about you? But that's the goal. And it's so important that these full-time members uh, in ministry of the, of the body of Christ recognize they're here to bless the members, the body. We're all, we're all on a goal-oriented Christian life to become complete in the Lord. What's the, what's the finish? Unto a complete man, unto the fullness of the measure or maturity of the Lord. And then why? That we no longer be infants. Tossed to and fro. The picture there is a, an, a sea full of unrest. So that you and I are no longer infants being tossed around like the waves of the sea or carried about by every wind of doctrine. That's a really interesting picturesque phrase the picture here is a person being handed off by one false teacher to another and then from him to another how many of you know believers like that that have been taken advantage of by crooks by liars by people living double lives they just take advantage of them they they, they kind of give the impression I've got the secret truth and you can only get it here. And so they get them for a while and get their money. Then they send them on their way rejoicing after they've fleeced them and emptied their pockets and they go to someone else and then someone else and then someone else. I can't tell you how heartbreaking that is to a man or a woman of God who's the real deal. We don't like to see people being taken advantage of. Do you? I hate to see somebody being played. It's so, so sad, so unfortunate. Uh, and it ought not to be. But again, do you see why the ministry gifts are there? Why the manifestations are there to keep this from happening? Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I want someone looking after me, don't you? I think every sheep should have a shepherd. Sheep don't know what to do without a shepherd. And they're, they're just open prey for wolves and, and, and sheep's clothing, if you will. So this is what it's about. Uh, carried about, deceived uh, by, the, uh, by the slight of men. Um, basically, just, yeah, just being deceived. And I've used that word before. It, it's the word we get our English word planet from. And the picture is this, this planet is in orbit and something takes it out of orbit. I've seen a lot of Christians over the years hit the skids. They get off the rails because of some false teacher or false prophet, uh, or someone told them, you don't need a local church. You don't need any oversight. Bless God, you've got the spirit in the Bible. Boom. You know, just get going. Save the world. And that's very sad because that leaves the person open to all kinds of attacks from the enemy. So I think it's, you know, important that you and I think about this and remember this concept of who's who. And how do these things all fit together? And how should they work? Because what's really neat is when, when it's working correctly, great things happen. Super things happen. You have a church where people know how to lead people to Christ, but they don't feel like they're, it's their obligation to pre preach three points in a poem, crack a couple of jokes and so on, and give altar calls, you know, or, or start uh, stand up on a rooftop someplace and uh, preach a message. They, they don't have that kind of burden anymore. They say, that's not my job. 
That's what the pastor is supposed to be doing. That's what the evangelist is supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be seeking spiritual gifts to operate in the service. I'm supposed to be able to give a, a witness anytime I get the opportunity. I'm supposed to be, you know, doing good works in the name of Christ, helping someone down and out, et cetera, et cetera, making a phone call, write an email or whatever. Um, but I, 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 I'm not doing the, the minister's job, and he shouldn't be doing mine, right? And if everybody does their job, that's a, it's a beautiful thing. We wouldn't still be here if we didn't have so many people over so many years that did so many things. We wouldn't be where we are. It's just, it just would be impossible. Some of you, most of you don't know when we started and how we started. Someone would have told me we'd be touching almost 180 countries. I'd have never believed it. All the different outreaches, you know, shortwave, AM, FM, um, mailing newspapers out, having meetings downtown, home meetings, you name it, we've done it. And we're probably going to be doing new stuff. It would have never happened if we didn't have the body functioning. You know, I wasn't trying to do their job. They weren't trying to do my job, but we were all doing what God gifted us to do. You hear about the church that his, his church hit, hit the skids, the pastor church hit the skids. He was complaining to a brother minister and said, I just don't know. I did everything I knew to do. I prayed, I preached. I took the offering, bless God. I led the worship best I could, played the piano till my fingers bled. Uh, I visited and went door to door. Uh, I, you know, I kept the, kept the books. I don't know what else I could have done for that church. He said, well, you, you sure did it. You killed it. What? You killed it. What do you mean I killed it? You didn't give the other people a chance to operate in their gifts. You did everything yourself. No wonder. You're about half backslid and the church closed the doors. That's what happens when we don't know who's who or what we're supposed to be doing. Flip that coin and it's a beautiful thing. Amen. It's a fantastic thing. And you can't, you can't put a stop on what it can do. A local church with a vision from God and people that will hang together rather than hang separately. <laughs> Anyhow, anybody have any questions on this tonight? Yeah, Bill. Yeah, you know, I've seen people over the years that uh, said they were a prophet or they were this or yep. that. Yep. And it's so easy for pride to come in, you know, claiming that I'm some one particular thing. And then I was thinking about, because it's dangerous, because yep. Yep. the pride in my own life has been the thing that's hurt me more than anything, to be honest with you. Wow. And, uh, or is it possible that God, here's the way I look at it, tell me if I'm wrong, that I've just got to be willing to do whatever God wants me to do, no matter what gift it is, right. and he kind of divides severally as he will, mm -hmm. as, you, as you're needed. Right. You know, I don't think for me it would be a good idea to be categorized as one particular thing, like I'm a prophet, you know, yeah. or I'm an evangelist. You know, I think we're all of everything if God decides to use. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. In, 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 this, in this sense that apart from the concept of these fivefold, that would be right. Um, as I say, the, the fivefold gifting is not something that comes and goes. It's a person. It's, a, it's permanent. So for Paul to say, no, nah, I don't, I don't want to go to Troas. I don't want to go to Philippi. He would be disobeying because he's an apostle. That's what he's supposed to do. But in terms of people that aren't in that fivefold, yeah, that's exactly the attitude we should have. Hey, you know, I want the gift of healing. What if he wants to use us in the word of wisdom? I had someone tell me one time, what, uh, my, my gift's discernment. What's yours? The, in their mind, and they, I'm not being critical, but they had misunderstood in their mind. First of all, there's no gift of discernment. It's discerning of spirits. And it's not permanent, like being a, an apostle or a prophet. It comes and goes. Does, the gift of discerning of spirits means it happens at a point in time. You may have it on Tuesday and not have it for another three months. These manifestations. But the people, they're permanent. But I hear what you're saying, Bill, about the pride thing. And not know they're an apostle? No. Okay. No. So you would know you're an Absolutely. Apostle. Yeah. Paul said it. Called from my mother's womb to be an apostle. No, I know I'm not an apostle. 
But it, you know, I go into all this in detail in my, in my courses, which is why I wrote them, because I think this kind of stuff is really important. Christians have been hurt, they've been confused, they, they've been burdened, they've been given false guilt by some teaching that takes that comma out. The ministry gifts are there to get me to do their work. No, it's not what it is at all. It's just three descriptions of the work of a minister. You know, to, to mend, heal, restore the church, to feed the church the word, and to build up the body of Christ. So ministers that don't do that, that fleece the sheep rather than feed the sheep, no bueno, you know, it's not, not the way it's supposed to be. Yeah, sure. They didn't have punctuation back then. Is that <coughs> no, it's true. It's true. But I'm saying when you bring Greek into, uh, they had no small letters either. They had what they call unchuls, you know, all all capital letters, all run together. Yeah. Um, Phil's got an example of that in the in the, that he let me use in my book on the Lord's Supper. But uh, the, the idea is when you translate something, that's when you use punctuation. You know, now, I mean there is some punctuation in terms of uh, there are periods and so on. Uh, that, that have been added, been there for a long time. But it, it's just that when you bring it into English, some, some Bible scholars just say, well, I think, based on what they're saying, I think. So to make it look like what they think, they just take out the comma. But I'm suggesting that that makes a big difference. So, okay, if we can't really decide by the punctuation, how do we decide? Context. You see there, when, you, when he completes his thought, He's still talking about the same thing, N not outreach to unsaved people. That's important, but that's not his. He's talking about what happens in the body of Christ and how these gifts work, you know. Yeah, sure. Uh, I've talked to a lot of ministers that say, you know, I've been called to preach, and I fought it. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. And I finally just gave up and did it. So, you know, if... Uh, <laughs> if you want to be like an apostle, say you want to be a, a prophet, right? And uh, <laughs> the, the fact that you want to be a prophet, right. would that make God be more likely to give you that wish? Very kind of like what I mentioned about the pastor, First Timothy three one. It would be an evidence, perhaps, that you have that calling. So you know, you you look at the you look at the office of the ministry. On the one hand, it's Christ's gift. He decides. God sets the members where it pleased him. But what about the, the manward side? How does that person know? And it's what you're talking about. Generally, they'll have a desire that won't go away. And as you say, and it's not funny. What you're saying is not funny. I've heard a lot of people say it. They don't want, a lot of people don't want to do it. I didn't exactly want to. I dogged it myself, even though I, I was preaching in the car. When I thought about living as a minister, <laughs> I, I really didn't want to do it, and I put all kind of fleeces up. I won't go into my story, but God was very kind to me, you know, uh, and he still got it, got it done. But um, I wanted to mention when you said something about, you know, person says, I am a prophet and all that, that's what you got to be careful about. We don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but some people, for me, anybody that's got little cards, Apostle Smith, Prophet Jones, to me, that's a blinking yellow light. You know, if you're an apostle, you will have the signs of an apostle and people will, you don't let, they don't have to wonder about it. You'll know, right? If you're a prophet, you will be, you'll be able to teach the word of God, preach the word of God, and you'll regularly have spiritual dreams and visions. If you're a teacher, you can teach and you'll t teach and people will be blessed when you teach, right? If you're a pastor, you will feed and lead and you'll be able to do it, um, but a lot of people nowadays, man, they just, I, I don't mean to be unkind, but it sure looks like they're just trying to make a buck, you know, and profit, and, uh, you know, the bigger the offering. Uh, one of our members mentioned in another church, they were either part of or visited, you got, you got a longer prophecy depending on how much you gave, and you had a different pew in the church. <laughs> Season tickets, you want to come up front? There's, there's, there's a price, <laughs> count the cost, you know. <laughs> Spin it like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can. I've been in meetings, you know, if you, if you want to do this, I'll, I'll prophesy a little bit longer. <laughs> get you to the edge of ecstasy, you know, but I got to get that other hundred bucks. Then I'll give you the punchline. Yeah. How important is being sent to being an apostle? Because you're going to have to go to the 
you can tell the clerk is going to fossil by the sending of a lot of different places, or you can tell that you might be called to be in a fossil yeah. by the sending to different places. Too. Maybe, but one. There are several things, but the one that's actually spelled out, that's actually spelled out, Paul, Paul uses it. He says to the Corinthians, the signs of, and he uses the article, the signs of the apostle, meaning the office, were performed among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So the, in that particular office, someone that claims to be an apostle and there's nothing happening, or you can tell you what happened six months ago somewhere else that you can't check out, but it never happens in the meeting they're in. So it's interesting you ask that, yeah. A apostle, stello, I, I send an apo, from. So someone sent from, in this case, a person sent from God. Uh, it's so interesting you mentioned that, Barb, because we, I'll be talking about Paul this coming Sunday. Some things that happened to him in, in relationship to guidance. Don't miss Sunday unless you don't need help with guidance. Oh, man, there's some awesome stuff we're going to look at on Sunday. Your line is, we'll be the judge of that. Solomon? Would you say that the main gifts And sometimes it's gradual. For, as I said, with Paul, he was an apostle, but he didn't start out that way. He started out as a prophet and a teacher. And then little by little, these other gifts surfaced, you know. Yeah, Bill. A guy can have a prophecy, and it could be right, uh -huh. and it could just be blind luck. Yeah. 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 Y
Oh, what should I do when that happens? Do it. Reach out, pray for that person, you know, buy them candy or whatever. Um, you see, but, but you see how this works, though, how practical this is. Theoretically, the saints should be getting mended, put back together from, minist- from the ministry gifts and then learning how to operate in the manifestations. It all comes together really awesome. And then if you've got a pretty nice-sized church, you may have apostles in there who will be guest speakers and then minister out from there to other places or teachers or evangelists. That's really cool, you know. Now, a smaller congregation, not as likely to have other ministry gifts there, but um, you get a fair-sized congregation, it's really cool. You may have a number of teachers. Greg, how many of you know Greg? He calls himself a teacher. He doesn't like to be called pastor or evangelist. He feels like God's given him a gift of teaching. It doesn't come and go. He's been doing it for years in different churches. He's always a blessing when he's here. Uh, But he wouldn't call himself an apostle. That's not his calling. He might be called an intercessor. You you, want to have a couple of laughs? Ask him about his prayer life. He made the mistake of asking God to use him now that he's retired about five years ago. He's using him. Sleep a few hours, pray a few hours. Sleep a few hours, pray a few hours. Have a couple visions. God talks to him, you know. That's just from being dedicated. It's awesome. So, yeah, absolutely. All those nine gifts are available to any believer who's spirit-filled. But, you know, you, you, that's what you have to be willing to do it. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I have to say it again. In a, in a mega church, actually function with what you talk about. Uh, yeah. It's just impossible. And, you know, the, the size of the church should be yeah. you know, just wow. limited, you know. Good question. Yeah. Good, like good question. Um, yeah, it would be more difficult for sure. Um, I mean, if you've got a lot of ushers around with mics that could. Uh, one of my mentors has a, a recording on, online that I listened to once in a while. I recommended it to Bill, several people. But while he's preaching, and he probably had several hundred, maybe a thousand people there, someone in the congregation starts speaking in tongues. You could hear it clear as anything. He just stopped. You can hear that person from a great distance. Everybody else could hear too. And then he interpreted it over the microphone. So it, can, it could happen, but yeah, I think it would be a lot more difficult. And maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe that's why, you know, the early church, the, most of the congregations were not huge. The whole church would be in a city if you put them all together, but they were meeting in homes and synagogues, and they, the actual individual congregations were probably not all that huge back then. So you'd have a lot of this. Like Paul told the Corinthians, one of you has a revelation, one has a tongue, one has an interpretation. Let all things be done decently and in order. I've said it before. I started my ministry in home meetings, and Barb remembers that happened all the time. 30, 40 people. You'd think you were a church, but it was someone's living room or they living in, living in dining room combined, folding chairs. You have prayer. You have worship. You have a guest teacher or preacher. You have prayer for the sick. You have the gifts of the Spirit operating the Lord's Supper, and then a meal. It was just like the book of Acts. I started my ministry teaching in places like that. Very cool, yeah. I can't even imagine a megachurch even ever doing communion because of the logistics. Now see, there would be a gift administration, Char, because I know Pastor Prince has it every week. Really? Yeah, and he's got five services, about five or 6,000 in each service. But you've got the you've got the people, you've got the manpower. Yeah. Like small groups, even in the through the week, yeah. Yeah. And like, I don't know how that works out. But they're not all together. No. No. It's probably. And you know what? What you're saying though is exactly right. And what happens? It's like that. The minister, the pastor, is actually pastoring his leaders, his deacons. In a sense, he's pastoring them primarily because he wouldn't have hands-on with everyone, but they do. This guy with 50 in his home group, this guy with 100 in his home group or whatever. So it gets done. You know, I'm not for or against mega churches, small, big. I don't know that there's a Bible pattern. All I can do is what I observe. You know, it talks about the church and their house. Paul finished up in a house church. Synagogues, if he had 15 males, you could have a synagogue. They were probably 1,500 seats or whatever you want to call it. I don't think there were any mega buildings till like, what, the Middle Ages and that? That would be interesting to see how that started. 
I've been to England, some of those Anglican cathedrals, they would seat several hundred, you know. So um, it's, it's kind of a fun topic, though, you know, looking, looking at how things work. Yeah, it's, Lisa. It would still be more difficult. It would be. Yeah. It would be, I mean, I've seen it in bigger churches. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm just reflecting on it. Oh, yeah? You're talking yeah, about it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I've been too. I've been to churches, and uh, it, it's a different feeling. It, not good or bad, it's just different. It doesn't necessarily feel like an average situation. It's, it can almost become entertainment. I don't mean to be critical, but I think it could almost be more entertainment where you're not actually participating, you know. My, one of my good friends who's in heaven now, Brother Jimmy, it was just his conviction. He was in the ministry over 40 years before he passed away. He, he told me he felt like somewhere around 250 should be a cutoff for a local church and then birth another one. That was just his view. If you had, say, an apostle that really had a gifting for a particular area, maybe have a church on the south, west, east, north. And when they get to 250 or so, where the pastor doesn't really know the people anymore, birth a new church. It was just his view. I think there's a lot of merit to that, you know. It's all the calling of God, too. What does God want? You know? Christians submit to do things in Yeah. Huh? Um, for Christian pastors, where do they go if they need like guidance? Christian pastors? Yeah. Good question. Do they just, like, where does they just go straight to the source? Right. Yeah, yeah. Mike's asking what about and somebody, what, what about the person giving the oversight? Where do they get oversight? It's a very good question. Um, you don't see it in the book of Acts, really. You, what you're saying is pretty much it that you deal, deal direct, like Paul. Um, but I think there's also the, con the concept of, um, well, it would depend. Like a pastor might have a friend who's in apostolic ministry. So he could get input. He could also get input from a prophet or a teacher. So I think among the ministers, I think it would come that way. Uh, but they make sure he checks with everybody. This is what I'm preaching now. So it's a exactly. Yeah. yeah, so a minister. Look up to an apostle, a pastor, I should say, a bishop, an elder. Yeah, could, or to other apostles, you know. But, yeah, I mean, the, apo the apostolic office is really quite a bit something on its own, in a sense. It doesn't mean it's a one-man band, but it's a very important, it's a foundation stone. And, and you know, if, if you figure, figure this man or woman can, can operate in all five offices, in a perfect world, they, they would be okay, you know. But, I mean, even they can make mistakes. How many remember that little one-on-one -on -one Peter had with, Paul had with Peter? One apostle talking to another one. Paul didn't get the memo that Peter was in charge of him and everybody else. He didn't get that memo. And he got in Peter's face. He said, what are you doing? Before these Judaizers came, you were, you were eating with the Gentiles. You, kosher rules went out the window. As soon as they showed up, you separated yourself. You're not being right. You're not walking uprightly. Can you imagine telling the Pope that? I'm not being funny. In the, in the minds of some people, that's what Paul did. He got out of line because Peter was the head of the church and he got in his face. Correction from the bottom, right? Unless they were equal and Peter wasn't over him, but that's another story. But yeah, there you have a correction one-on-one, -on -one. yeah. Isn't it an apostle somebody that has actually had an encounter with Jesus? Is that an apostle? Is yeah, I mean, I, I would place? think so. Yeah, I would think so. Um, I mean, as I say, the only thing that's actually written down is uh, signs, wonders, and miracles constantly following. That's the signs of an apostle, according to Paul. Um, but that wouldn't be the only thing. Also a gift of ruling or taking the lead and uh, being able to preach, obviously, teach. Uh, ruling would mean you, you would be able to oversee things, you know. Like all the early apostles had churches too, pretty much. Even Paul did for a while, pastored. So um, it's a good question. I mean, the, technically today we would be calling them missionaries, but I, most missionaries don't, can't, don't line up with the biblical picture of pastor, of an apostle. Very, I, you know, I don't see a lot of it anyway, but I, you know, I'm not out in the field like I used to be. Anybody else? You could stay here for months, couldn't you? Really? I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it, you guys did it. It's your fault asking questions. We're going to come around the Lord's table. If you're giving tonight, that's super. Some baskets here, one in the foyer. 
And um, thanks for thinking of God's people and the work of the Lord. He's keeping the old doors open. Amen. He's awesome. If you can make it Sunday, that would be super.